I, I believe tonight that Bishop has come in divine destiny to this house and he's going to speak to us. Uh, Bishop Baron Ash travels all over America and around the world preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is a man of great depth, a man of tremendous ability, and God is going to use him in this house tonight. I would love for you, since you know how we love to welcome men of God in this house, I would love for you to welcome to this pulpit Bishop Varon Ash. Father, it is indeed always right to give you thanks and to give you praise. For this is the chief end of man, that we may glorify you and enjoy you all the days of our lives. And so again, we join our voices with the unending hymn of praise that is sung by angels and archangels, principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, and the many-eyed cherubim and the six-winged seraphim who covering their faces and feet, flying, singing, and saying that you are holy and that the heavens and the earth are filled with your glory. And so, God, we've come to give glory to your glory, to exalt, to extol, to magnify, and to bless your most holy name. And as a secondary consequence of our worship, we ask you to speak to us. Not as though we were babes, but as though we were fathers. Not from the outer court, but from the holy of holies. We didn't come out all week for milk. We came out for meat. Feed us. And we will be changed from this vile image into the likeness of your glorious image. Now, God, grant me thine succor and thy favor, clarity of thought and precision of speech. Above all, your anointing, which makes preaching easy and hearing the word a sweet delight. Allow a cherubim to take a coal off of the altar to touch my lips, that the words that I speak shall not be mine own, but they shall be yours for the edifying of this thy people. In the name of your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through your all holy, good, consubstantial spirit, we pray, amen and amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Calvary, I am honored and, I am honored and humbled to be here with you and uh, to share with you during this camp meeting. I was elated when my office received the invitation, and, and uh, I'm excited to be here today with your pastor. I had a chance to meet him just once at uh, uh, Pastor uh, Clint Brown's church, and I was uh, just excited that uh, the Holy Spirit made such an impression through me that evening that I would be uh, considered to be one of the speakers this week. And so thank you, uh, Pastor Rayleigh and Sister Rayleigh, for allowing me to be here with you and your great congregation. I do not determine the greatness of a congregation by their size or their edifice, but by their worship. And you are pastoring a great church, and God considers you a great people. Many people that worship like that. You can tell a lot about a church by what is important to them. And you can tell what is important to them by how they prioritize their service. Obviously, God is the priority here. And so I'm glad to be in a place where God is the priority. And thank you for all of God's people. Amen. And just glad to be here with you guys tonight and during this, uh, this camp meeting. And you brought me here to preach, so I'm not going to go too long with too many preliminaries, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. A couple friends drove, up, drove down also from uh, uh, Faith World to be with me, and I appreciate them being with us, and I love you guys. Um, there's something in my spirit when my office got the information about the camp meeting, and something has been stirring in my spirit for several months actually so I'm going to develop it here I usually don't know what I'm going to say till I say it so I don't know the end of a thing till I'm finished so I'm finished when I'm through and I'm through when I'm done so <laughs> you'll get where I got to go and uh, but we're uh, when I saw that the the theme for the church is possessing the land that speaks a lot to me 
because God's covenant is always connected to possessing. And the covenant that God made with Israel is connected to the land. That's why there's so much stress. That's why September 11th happened and we have so much stress in the Middle East. It's not over oil, it's over land. You can argue all day. The issue ultimately has to do with the issue of covenant and what God is trying to establish in the earth, which is his kingdom. And uh, I thought about that and thought about prior, as I was praying in the flight today, what God is saying to you as a particular community and where you're headed over the next couple of years. And so I asked God that my message would not be simply something designed or developed to tickle men's ears, but rather that it would give you the prophetic insight into your future so that you can have a little more clarity and precision concerning the path that God has already put you on. So I've come to confirm and affirm what you probably already know, but to simply let you know you're walking down the right path and you're headed right where God wants you. If you have your Bibles, notice with me the book of Numbers, the 14th chapter. Numbers 14, beginning in verse 20, 20 through 24. If I could have just a little bit, maybe a little more monitors and a little more house would be fine. And maybe some, some MIDI. I have no mid-range in here, so I'll just... <clears throat> verse 20, and the Lord said... Numbers 14, verse 20, And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten days, times and have not hearkened to my voice surely they shall not see the land which i swear unto the fathers neither shall any of them that provoked me see it but my servant caleb because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully him will I bring into the land wherewith he went and his seed shall possess it but my servant Caleb because he had another spirit with him look at your neighbor repeat my subject after me say neighbor what kind of spirit do you have? It was once said that blood is thicker than water. It should be equally said that spirit is thicker than blood. The spirit of a man determines his successes and his failures. It is the spirit of a man that drives him, fills him with passion, and brings him to a place of destiny and purpose. The scripture teaches us that the spirit of a man bears his infirmities, but a wounded spirit who can bear. When your spirit is strong, there is nothing that you will ever deal with or encounter in life that will catch you off guard. But when your spirit is wounded or weak, the smallest things get to you and can disturb your interior peace, which is supposed to pass all understanding. This is why it astounds me that in America and in Western Christianity more than any place else, we teach a lot about the spirit, but we neglect our spiritual man more than anyone else. We understand that we are both flesh and blood and spirit and divine. We are a dichotomy. We are spiritual beings and human beings. We are flesh beings and spiritual beings. And, and because of that, we, we have to maintain both persons. We have to take care of our human being, uh, our flesh being, and we have to also maintain our spiritual being. You cannot expect your spirit to win the war against your flesh when your flesh eats better, lives better, and gets everything it wants. You cannot expect your spirit to 
gain the victory in the temptations that you are wrestling with when you only feed it on Sunday. But you feed your flesh all week. When you get up in the morning and have breakfast and, and, and have a little donut during your break or a Snickers and have your little lunch and have your little bag of chips in between and have a big dinner and a pint of ice cream before you go to bed. And then you get on your knees and pray two or three minutes and maybe say thank you, Jesus, while you're driving because you put in a good tape. And, and maybe somewhere along the line stopped and prayed because you realize your bills have not yet been paid. And then you have only made a minimal investment in your spirit and yet you wonder why your spirit does not have the power to overcome the lust of the flesh. If you want to flip the script, like they say, on, 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 on your flesh, you've got to begin to feed your spirit more than you feed your flesh, man. You've got to make a greater investment in the spiritual part of you, which is the true you, which is the eternal you, which is the you that existed before and will exist after, which is the you that will have to give an account to God, which is the real you, which no man knows except God reveals who you really are. So that's the real you, and you're investing in what's going to pass away. You, 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 you dress your flesh man, and you, 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 you make sure he, he's comfortable, and you make sure he eats well, and you make sure that whatever he wants, he gets, and whatever the spirit longs for, you neglect. The scripture teaches us that there is a flesh, that there is a, the Bible says that the flesh lusteth against the spirit, but the verse continues that the spirit lusteth against the flesh. There is a lust of the Holy Ghost. There is an equal lust of the spirit and the spirit must equally lust for things. Your spirit is longing for things and just like your flesh longs for things, your spirit longs for things. And if you do not fulfill the desire of your spirit, you weaken it. And so it's a longing for prayer and longing for more time in the word and longing for more covenant relationships with people who are substantial and men of integrity and people who have vision. And you continue to surround yourself with losers and people that ain't got nothing and ain't going nowhere and don't pray and don't fast and don't seek God. And their conversation is always filled with things concerning the earth realm and not the heavenly realm. Number says that Caleb had another spirit with him. Your spirit determines your successes or your failures. And the spirit of a man is the most important part of a man. It is that part that comes directly from God. It was that that was breathed in him from the beginning. And you just didn't start here 30, 40, 50 years ago. You just didn't show up here then. You were in God's mind way before your grandmama and your granddaddy went on their first date. Your mother and father only provided a body for a spirit that had already been in existence in his mind. Your mother and father were convenient to your destiny but not necessary. Therefore, you are not limited by their DNA or their genetic structure or their failures or their lack of being anywhere because you did not get your spirit from them. You got your spirit from God. Give me a few moments. It takes me a little while, but I know where I'm going. So the spirit of a man is something that is highly neglected, and yet the Bible says that in the midst of this litany, of condemnation God is obviously angry with Israel and in the midst of this litany he ceases to be angry and the tenor of his language changes from anger to favor because somebody in the midst of everybody messing up got his attention and what got God's attention was the spirit of this man I'll never forget the first time I went to Israel many, many years ago, and I've been there many times since. But if you've ever been to Israel, on the side of every taxi cab and on the side of, of their airports and on the doors of the airports, and uh, as a sign of the national symbol of tourism, you will see two men carrying a bunch of grapes. And these two men, and that's a, the national symbol of tourism for Israel. So one day I asked one of the cab drivers, I, I said, Habib, or whatever his name was back then, I said, listen, what is, uh, what is this symbol? Who are these guys on the side of this, this taxi cab? And he looked at me and he said, he said, well, uh, he said, these are Joshua and Caleb. I said, well, why, why are they on the side of everything? He said, well, they were the first two tourists to ever visit this country. <laughs> the 
Numbers 14 introduces us to a popular text that we should all be familiar with. God tells Moses that it is now time for you to possess the promised land. And in order for you to possess the promised land, I need you to find me 12 men. Each one must be a ruler in his own right. And he must be picked from each tribe. And they are to be sent into the wilderness. And they are to be sent into the promised land. And they are to bring back a report. And so Moses comes to a place called Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh from the Hebrew, Kadish, Kadisho, means to be holy, holiness. And Barnea, Barneo in the Hebrew means heights. Kadesh Barnea is the heights of holiness. Let no man dissuade you. When you're holy, you're not low down. When you're holy, you're high up. People who are holy have a different position. They see things differently than others because their position is differently. And people may not understand why you can rejoice when all Gehenna, Sheol, Hades, Infierno for the Latinos, or hell for those of you that don't speak any of those languages. When all hell breaks loose, people don't understand why you're not worried because if you're holy, you're high. And if you're high, you see things they don't see. So don't no man dissuade you when you suffer to live right and suffer to do things right when other folks doing whatever they want to do and you're paying the price and you're struggling with your personal integrity and your personal holiness. Let no man dissuade you and look down on you like you're ignorant or something's wrong with you or you're missing the party or you're not having a good time because people who pursue holiness have vision and they see things that other people don't get a chance to see and people mocked us and called us holy rollers and made fun of us because while they were doing what they wanted to do we were struggling to get in his presence but what they didn't understand is when we die in his presence we can see things not like other people see them because if you're holy you're high up so the bible says that god told moses to bring them to the place called kadesh barnea and when he brought them to the place called kadesh barnea the bible says that moses instructed them and called 12 men 12 men each had to be a ruler and the bible says that he called caleb and caleb was a member of the tribe of judah it's not by accident that the man who was different came from the land called praise it was not a coincidence or an accident or a haphazard event that, that the one guy who had a different spirit hung out around folks who were always saying he's an awesome God. Because where you hang out determines how you see things. Caleb in the Hebrew, Caleb, Caleb means to be bold, valiant. It also means a dog. Which is kind of funny because why would you raise up a leader? Why would a father name him, name his son a dog? I mean, there's nothing too valiant or prestigious about calling your firstborn son a dog. I didn't understand the importance of it until I started breeding and raising Neapolitan Mastiffs at their biggest uh, when they are fully mature they weigh about 180 pounds and and i breed them and i'll never forget that when one of them i have one that's a bit of a problem and and i'll never forget that i had i had dropped something and when i went to grab it to get it he thought i was trying to play and he grabbed it and bit a hold of it and the harder i pulled the harder he pulled back and the harder i shook the harder he shook his head and i realized i wasn't getting this away from him easy and then god spoke and said that Caleb, people who praise God, when they get a hold of God, they don't let go of the thing they're hungry for easy. And people who worship, when it's time when you're praying for your unsaved son to get saved, and other folks gave up and stopped praying, you say, I ain't going to stop praying because I'm from the land of Judah. And you can call me a dog. Well, if you want to call me a dog, I know who let the dogs out. I let them out tonight because when you get a... When you get a hold of God, when you get a hold of your desire, you tell him, I'm not letting go of it. I'm going to keep knocking on your door. I'm going to be like the unjust one. I'm going to be like the woman with the unjust judge. I'm going to keep coming till you get tired of me, till you get sick of hearing me, and you accomplish what I have asked of you. Caleb, Caleb, me 
means to be called a dog. Maybe there's something prophetic. I have a very diverse group of friends. And sometimes there's a whole, you know, all the young people today, they walk up on you now and they say, what's up, dog? <laughs> so I humble them. I say, nothing much, puppy. <laughs> and be careful when you say that. You could get shot in the wrong city. But, <laughs> but maybe there is a prophetic cry in this generation to get a hold of God and not let go of him, to get a hold of prayer, to get a hold of destiny and desire and wanting more for their life. The Bible says in the 13th chapter of Numbers that, that not only was Caleb a member of Judah, but the Bible says his father, his name is Jephunneh. In the Hebrew, Yephunneh actually, because there is no J in the Hebrew language. So it would be Yephunneh. Yephunneh means it shall be prepared. So it shall be prepared is a statement of faith. So his, man, his father was a man of faith. And the land he lived in was a land of praise. You're not hearing me. Because who you hang out with determines how you see things. Your perception is based upon your relationships. Your friends are a prophecy of where you're going. You want to know your future? Look at your friends. You want to find out what your son's going to become? Find out who he hangs out with after school. You want to find out where your daughter is headed in her future? Find out the young lady she's talking to late at night on the telephone getting her information from. Because your friends are a prophecy of where you're going. You hang out with folks that ain't got nothing, ain't trying to get nothing, don't want to be nothing, have no prayer life, no dedication, no desire, no passion for anything. And all they want to do is go to Denny's after church and don't want to get in his presence. And all they're talking about is, did you see the shoes the preacher was wearing? Where does he get his suit tailored? But they're not walking out of here saying, my God, I want to get on my face in the presence of God. I want God to stir up my heart for prayer again. When, when people, and, and, and you, get, you, you start hanging around folks that all they're doing is gossiping and lying and then you wonder why your life is so messed up because your friends are a prophecy of where you're going you need to change where you live you need to change who you hang out with you need to find somebody like Jeff Nay who is always saying it shall be prepared don't worry that you don't have it we gonna get it if we continue to stay in the land of praise don't worry that it's not there yet don't worry that you don't have it yet Jeff Nay means a man of faith it means it shall be prepared you need to hang out with folks who will always believe that God can do it in spite of how messed up you are they'll say listen I know you're you're struggling but it's gonna get better I know it's hard but he shall prepare it I know you don't see it yet but God will make a way out of nowhere I know you I know, I know you don't understand it but God's done it for other people and he'll do it for you you need to find people of faith Yefune in the Hebrew means it shall be prepared. And not only was his father always saying God's going to make a way, but everybody that lived outside of the house, he lived in the land of Judah. So in his house, every time that there was something went wrong and his mama said, we ain't got no money for food, his daddy was saying, shut up, woman. It shall be prepared. And every time Caleb came home feeling bad because the other kids in school were smarter and the other kids were getting A's and he said, I'm stupid. Shut up, Caleb. You are not stupid. I named you a dog because when you get a hold of something, you don't let go of it. I didn't name you a dog because you're low. I named you a dog because of your tenacity and it shall be prepared. You shall get an A. You shall pass. And that's the kind of folks you, that's the kind of parents you need to be. Stop calling your child a devil. Stop looking down on them. Stop blaming it on ADD and everything else. When your child comes home with an F, you need to say, Stand right there. Let me prophesy to you. You will get an A next time. You will be the head and not the tail. You will bring home a third grade report card. You will look at your daughter and say, you will not end up pregnant. You will not fall in love with somebody that does not have a job. You will go to college. You will become somebody. You are on your way to secular success and greatness. It shall be prepared. And then, not only did they live in the house of Jephunneh? They left, left, lived in the land of Judah. Judah means praise. In the Hebrew, it is yada. Yada means to throw out your hands in thanksgiving. Judah is praise. So not only when he gets in the house, his daddy said God's going to make a way. 
when he tries to get away from his dad nagging him and goes outside everybody in the neighborhood is saying hallelujah god is an awesome god he's a majestic king blessed be the lord our god he is holy you can't hang out with people like that and your perception not be changed you can't be a joe blow a normal john doe and anybody you cannot be mediocre and settle for mediocrity and blend in when you praise people who praise God become resilient and stand out in a crowd you can be wearing Kmart and JC pennies but you still stand out because when you're a praiser you don't need a nice car or a nice home there is something that glows from your face that says that's somebody special and some people may not want to hang out with you because you caught the bus here tonight some people may not sit next to you because you're not wearing the clothes they wear and you ain't making the money they make but I'm here to prophesy to you if you are a praiser God ain't concerned with how you got here but he knows where you're going baby and some folks may have counted you out because it looks like you ain't got nothing but when you begin to praise God God will rise you out of obscurity and bring you to a place of prominence if you understand who you are and where you are give me a few minutes I'm gonna preach after a while Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of the tribe of Judah. Judah, Yada in the Hebrew, Judah. Judah means to praise. It, for the Hebrew scholars, Judah is spelled Yad Dalet He. Yad Dalet He is how we spell Judah. Yad Dalet He means to throw out your hands in an expression of praise and thanksgiving. Yad Dalet He, Judah, Yada, is the secondary root word is Yada without the He or without the H at the end. Yad Dalit. Yada without the H at the end means to be sexually intimate. It is the word that is used whenever husband and wife are intimate. Adam knew Eve. Yada. Abraham knew Yada. Always Jacob knew Rachel. Yada. The word Yada means to be intimate. You're not getting it. The secondary root word of praise means to be intimate. Uh, li 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 listen, 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 listen. You can't praise and not get pregnant. You may come in here empty. You may come in here feeling like you're a loser. You may come in here without a destiny, without a purpose, struggling. But when you begin to tell God how awesome, how majestic, how wonderful he is, all of a sudden you feel yourself getting pregnant. You feel yourself wanting and desiring. I wish there was somebody here that wants to get pregnant with a destiny, pregnant with a ministry, pregnant with a prayer life, pregnant with an anointing, pregnant with a, a passion for him. You can't praise and not get pregnant. Put your neighbors and leave me alone. If you don't like what I'm doing, sit somewhere else. This is the land of Judah. Caleb, Caleb. It's a dog. Yada too. You can't praise and not get pregnant. Praise is reciprocal. There is a relationship. You can't tell God who he is and God not tell you who you are. We're not here to just have a good time. We're here to get pregnant. See, y'all got it wrong. The pleasure of intimacy is a secondary consequence of the purpose of intimacy. The purpose of intimacy is for pregnancy. A secondary consequence of purpose is pleasure. Now, 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 if I had some deep folks, y'all would have just got a revelation. Because some of you are pursuing pleasure and not purpose. You just want to feel better. But, but you're not pursuing what God has called you to do. 
but you can only find true pleasure. That's why you can buy cars and homes and clothes and gold and jewelry and still never be happy because if you pursue pleasure for the sake of pleasure but your pleasure is not connected to your purpose then you will never be happy because your soul has become a vacuum that just sucks stuff into it but is never fulfilled and is never happy because what you are looking for is God and until he becomes the priority in your life until he becomes the focus of your life everything you buy and everyone you hang out with will never be able to silence your squandering soul that is longing for out of here sit down I'm gonna preach in a minute Yada, yada, it, hey, yada, it, hey, yada, it, yada, without the H, without the hey at the end, it means to be intimate. If we look at the primary root word, which is yad, yad, dalit, without the hey, without the second aleph in it, or the vowel, we then have the word yad. Yad means hand. Yad, hand. Hand means power, authority, and dominion. You can't praise and not get power. You can't praise and not and dominion. You can't praise and God not give you authority. See, people just try, people make you think that praise is preliminaries. Praise is not a preliminary. God has, let me tell you something. If the pastor got up after you got through worshiping and said you are dismissed, you've done enough. Somebody said, but, 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 but what about the preaching? What about the preaching? The preaching is the most important part of the service. Uh, wrong answer. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. The preaching is not the most important part of the service. Praise is the most important part of the service. Because praise is what we give God. Preaching is what the preacher gives to you. It's what God gives to you through the preacher's intellect. But praise is what you give to God. And so if I have not said anything to God, God has nothing to say to me. <laughs> praise gets God here. Now watch, I'll prove it to you for the theologians. But you'll say, but, but, but preaching saves sinners. Which shows then that preaching is not the highest form of an offering to God. Because if preaching is designed to save sinners, then preaching is the secondary consequence of sin. So we must preach today because Adam sinned yesterday. But had Adam not sinned, he still would have had to praise. You can have church without preaching, but you can't have church without praise. Don't cut the praise short so the preacher can have more time. tell them no 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 don't sing anymore because we need to get the preacher up oh no 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 because because if i get up and god's not here then i can preach for an hour but if he's not here my preaching doesn't get god here your praise get <laughs> listen listen sit down sit down watch watch now watch this, watch this. So if we continue to, if we continue to define the word yod and find a deeper lexical meaning, we would have to go further into the lexicon and find out that yod does not only mean, mean hand, power, and authority, but yod means an axle. Now I'm not very mechanical, but I know what an axle does. An axle is what turns stuff around. So the root word of praise is an axle. So if you don't like the way things are going, you are a praise away from turning it around. If you don't like what the doctor said, you are a praise away. You don't like what your boss said, you are a praise away. Wave the midnight hour. God's gonna turn it around. He's gonna work in your faith. Praise 
turns things around. They are in the land of Judah and in the house of Jephunneh. You cannot live in the land of praise and in the house of faith and not have a different spirit. Where you hang out with and who you hang out with determines the kind of spirit you're going to have. If you got a bitter spirit, don't have, have you ever met folks that got a, just a, a, an evil, mad, angry spirit? You ever had a Sunday school teacher just drove you away from the church? Just kids were scared to go to Sunday school. You had just, just ugly spirits. Caleb had another kind of a spirit. What kind of spirit do we have? Because the spirit that we have determines whether we will succeed, succeed or fail. You can name it and claim it and blab it and grab it all day, but until your spirit rises to the occasion, it will never accomplish what God has called you to accomplish. And the thing that gives you a spirit, this is why, this is why you will find that the land of Reuben is found in the land of Judah. Reuben in Hebrew means faith. Judah means praise. Reuben, faith is found. If you look at the geographical location, the land of Reuben is in Judah. So faith is found in praise. Watch this. You can have faith and not praise. But you can't praise and not end up getting faith. You don't need a seminar, a workshop, a tape series to get faith. You just need a praise service. You can't sit, I don't care how bad your situation is, you can't sit in the service telling him you're an awesome God. I love you, Jesus, more than anything. You are a mighty conqueror. You're my everything. You're Jehovah. You're the hallelujah. Amen. You're everything. You're the master of my soul. You're the deliverer of my... You can't talk to him like that and God not begin to raise up faith in you. You couldn't see it yesterday, but you can see it today because now you see him. And when you begin to see him in a new light, God begins to give you a new revelation. That's why the Bible says that when God sent Judah to go take his possession, the Bible says, take Reuben, your brother, with you. Praise said, bring faith with you. He didn't tell faith, go get praise. He told praise, go get faith. Praise will go get faith. Praise will get stuff you don't have when you praise. That's why don't let any man dissuade you or discourage you or run you out of here and tell you too loud, you make too much noise. Some folks look at you crazy and, and, and move over in the seat because you're making them uncomfortable. Well, tell them, move on over because I'm not going to shut up. I came here to get my deliverance. After you've been through hell all week, you had to deal with your boss and your job. You had to deal with taxes and, and, and the Middle East and September 11 and your family and your kids going crazy and your husband going crazy and then you come to church and you want me to act so did it this is the one place I ain't gonna put on a show I've come here to get my life together to give God praise and to get myself delivered and I ain't gonna let you with your religious self mess me up I'm in the land of praise I've, 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 I've got to finish I've got to finish with my first point He was of the tribe of Judah. His name meant he was a dog. His father said it shall be prepared. And they lived in the land of praise. And he had another spirit. So now God, through Moses, selects 12 leaders. Now let me say this about Caleb. Caleb was not just a member of Judah. The Bible says he was a leader. He was the head of praise. See, some folks like to jump in after others pave the way. Some people, you, you always know the folks, they, they get here 10 minutes late. While other folks have already been in his presence for 10 minutes. You coming in, get, get not, jumping in on the tail end of Caleb does not wait for other folks to dance. Caleb doesn't wait for somebody else to start running and then jump up behind them. Caleb does not wait for someone else to begin to praise. Caleb is the first guy up. Caleb is the guy that gets on everybody's nerves. 
while you trying to be cute and worried about visitors may not understand the way you're acting but because this person is always up at the altar dancing and jumping and running around and other folks rolling their eyes at him Caleb does not care what other people think about him because Caleb knows that I'm not here for you I'm here because God has delivered me and I'm giving him what is worth I wonder if I have any Caleb's here that don't need anyone else to beg them and prime them and pump them I think one of the inherent pitfalls one of the inherent pitfalls of the Pentecostal charismatic movement is we have made it too easy for you we tell you what you have to do stand up turn around kiss your neighbor say hello praise the Lord clap your hands sit back down jump on your head spit in your neighbor's face come here walk over there do this praise the Lord don't praise him stand up clap your hands again look at your neighbor tell them I love you look at your other neighbors say get away from me look at the person behind you tell them you're ugly look at the person in front of you say you look better praise God clap your hands again say amen shout hallelujah and, and so we've become we don't do anything until they tell us to do it so we're sitting there we're ready to praise but 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 God but the Bible does not say wait to the praise leader the Bible says enter his gates uh, whoa, 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 wait. That, that, that I don't wait till I get in I, I don't wait till I'm in the house I don't wait till the choir starts to sing I don't wait till the choir begins to praise I wait right at the door I don't have to get in the building but while you're trying to get the organ together I'm outside in the foyer I'm standing out here while you trying to be cute get your dress your money together I'm here saying Lord I want to thank you thank you for saving me thank you for delivering me so when I come in I enter I enter his gates I come in with a praise I come in with a song I come in with a shout I enter his gates with thanksgiving you want to see people healed you don't have to wait for the preacher to lay hands on you when you enter his gates with thanksgiving can you imagine next Sunday that nobody comes in the building because folks are outside just praising God and they say wait a minute is the church overflow no I can't get in why can't you get in because the foyer is filled with folks saying thank you that I'm delivered thank you that I'm saved folks are get healed in the parking lot people are get delivered in was a leader in praise and when leaders worship we've been giving leadership position to the wrong people we let the guy that pays a lot of money we make him an elder the guy that's been here 40 years. You're like, uh-uh. It's the guy who praises, who's a leader. It's the man who stands up and lifts his hands and is not too dignified and too sophisticated and too cute, but says, God, you've been good to me. And whatever success I have, I owe it all to you. <laughs> Sit down, I'm gonna preach in a minute. He was a leader in praise. Moses told him, go into the promised land and bring back a report. And the Bible says that 12 men went into the promised land. 12 men, all leaders, all presbyteri, elders in their own right. These are men of distinction and integrity. They all saw the same thing. They all saw the houses that they would not have to build. They all saw the fields and the vineyards. They all saw the grapes the size of watermelons. They all saw the cows the size of tractor trailers. They saw the wheat fields and the storerooms filled with honey. They all saw the prosperity of the land. And they all saw the giants. 
all of them saw the same thing. But they interpreted what they saw differently. And what affected their interpretation of what they saw was the spirit that was on them. So when Moses asked for a report, ten men said, they are giants and we are grasshoppers. And two guys said, God has made them bread unto us. Ten guys saw themselves as minuscule in comparison to the enormity of the enemy that they had to engage. Two guys did not even give them the pleasure of being called the main course. I was raised in a West Indian home by a Jamaican family. And every now and though they would, they would cook some callaloo. Y'all don't know nothing about that. And, 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 and ital, and they would cook up some rutabaga and put some, some bean and rice proper right on the side of the plate there, you know. Mash it up with enough gravy. And then them bring out what they can call a Johnny cake. You know what a Johnny cake is? Just a little piece of bread put on the side like that, you know. You take the bread and you save it till you just sop up the juice. Just, just drench it in it and just put it in your mouth just to get all the gravy so the plate look clean, not even have to wash it, put it back up on top of the plate. Don't it? Our. That's what Caleb said. Caleb said, this book ain't even meatloaf. This book ain't nothing but a piece of bread you used to just sop up the grease and the gravy with when you finish with it. God has made them bread unto us. See, what determines how you see and perceive your problem is the spirit that is on you. And you will deal with every situation based on your perception. Your perception is based on your spirit. And your spirit is the result of the people you hang out with because every man's spirit is the sum total of mantles and anointings of those that he has surrounded himself with. Are you listening to me? So, so, so my spirit is not only the spirit that God has placed within me, but, but it's a little bit of the men that I have allowed to speak into my life life and to father me and the people that I hang out with and the people that I've connected with me with and those people have all placed and added their spirit to, to my spirit and so now I have a multicolored coat like Joseph had I got a little bit of your anointing a little bit of your anointing a little bit of your anointing so you better be careful whose anointing you're getting whose spirit you're getting because it's going to determine how you see things and when 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 you over in a corner it would count your fingers coming up with 11 trying to get your prozac to your mouth and get your glass of water because you're having a nervous breakdown because you're too stressed out because everything's going wrong somebody else is in another corner and they just sitting there While you're trying to get your lithium and your written and all your prescription together, they're saying God is a good God and I'm not worried about it because God has made a way for me. Because of the spirit, you have to be careful. Watch this. Who you hang out with. Because some people have a vested interest in your failure. Do you understand that there are some people that don't want you to have nothing? Because they don't have nothing. And because they don't have faith, they don't want you to get faith. Because as long as you don't have nothing, you're the, you, you will still always be connected to them. Do you know that there are some people of a, that are afraid that you will, they, they never want you to find a husband? Because you're the only friend they have. And if you get a husband, they're going to be alone and miserable by themselves because they ain't got enough faith to believe God. You better never get a job because as long as the day you get a job, you will not be coming over to their house at 9 o'clock, turning on all my children and young and restless and Oprah and then Jenny Craig or Jenny whatever her name is and everybody else. 
so they have a vested interest in your failure so they continue to keep you depressed and continue to keep you down and continue to feed your emotional instability and continue to luxuriate your dysfunction and continue to make you it's, all, it's gonna be well you know you're just fine God just loved you just the way you are he said you know that's all right because as long as you don't have anything and they don't have anything, you can't point the finger at them. But the moment God begins to prosper you and brings you out of your place of me mediocrity, you begin to step out and God begins to do something for you. And God begins to break you out of that place. Then all of a sudden, they begin to have a problem with you and you didn't do nothing but get better. And now they don't like you. And now they say, well, now, now she thinks she's somebody. No, you think that I think that I'm somebody. It's a funny thing. It seems like people should celebrate your successes. It seems like when you begin to do better, that those that are close to you would celebrate it and would be excited for you, would begin to be joyous with you. But instead, you begin, that's how you know who your true friends are. You don't know who a real friend is until you get better, until stuff starts getting right, until you begin to prosper. You always gonna have a lot of friends when you ain't got nothing. Look at every street corner in the ghetto. It's always 12 guys sitting together. Ain't none of them got a job. Ain't none of them got a life. Ain't none of them got nothing. And they always got, but we got each other dog you and me forever I don't want you with your nothing ain't got nothing ain't going nowhere I want to connect myself with folks that are getting something and going somewhere and are trying to do better oh god I gotta finish I gotta finish I gotta finish I gotta finish Watch, watch, watch. And the thing that determined, I'm excited, watch this. The thing that determined how they interpreted what they saw was where they spent their time. Now watch. Do not become dissuaded because you do not see things the way other people see things. Whenever you are called to greatness, you will have to deal with the perplexing question of sanity you will wrestle with the issue have I lost it because you will find yourself in the minority let me let me say something to you let me say something to you the majority is not always right Watch this, folks. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Let me. The majority is not always right. Why is the majority not always right? Ten men said we can't do it. Two said we can't. Sometimes you will find yourself siding with the minority. You will find yourself with just a few who are hungry for more of him. Watch it. Do not become dissuaded because you do not see things the way other people see things. Watch this. God told Moses, build me a tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, you shall have four sides to it. And God said that the children of Israel shall gather at each end of the tabernacle. Three tribes shall be to the north, three tribes to the south, three tribes to the east, and three tribes to the west. Judah shall be in the east. Now watch this. Praise is in the east. The east is where the sun rises. People who praise have the luxury of seeing the first light watch it now you can run over to the west side and tell folks on the west that there's light on the east they're not going to believe you because they don't see it because they're not on the east so you have the privilege of seeing the move of god before anyone else sees it So you will feel out of place because you will have to declare what is not popular because other people do not see it. So be not, don't be discouraged because other leaders may not see the way you see it. And other men in your city or, or, or that have been connected with you in the past do not understand why you're doing things the way you're doing them. Because the thing is maybe they're from a different tribe and maybe they don't see things the way you see it. But those who are from the tribe of Judah, they have the privilege of seeing what God does before anyone else sees it. They have the privilege of seeing the blessing and the prosperity and the vision before I, while other folks are waiting to shout you're dancing and they don't understand why you're dancing they don't understand why you're smiling they don't understand why you're excited they don't understand why you're doing what you do but they're excited
because you see things differently. Now watch this. Watch this. Caleb was from the tribe of Judah, the house of Jephunneh. A leader went into the promised land and saw things differently. You see things differently. And have you ever noticed when you begin to share with people what you see, how they look at you like you're crazy? <laughs> have, have, you ever, have you ever been perplexed that sometimes you, you, you don't even want, you, you're just afraid to talk to other Christians because of their lack of faith. And then you begin to talk about spiritual things. You walk up to them and, you know, you, you, you just pulled up, you know, in, in a car half broken down and, and, and your clothes, you know, you gluing stuff together and. You ain't got but one suit and three ties, but you can switch them ties up and make somebody think you. You ain't got but two dresses, but about six scarves. You just tie that scarf one time around the waist, another time around the neck. And then, that's a new dress, no. Take that scarf, and when visitors come over, you hey, put it over your couch and say, what's well, a new couch, no. That was my dress from Sunday. <laughs> You don't have much, and then people come in, and you start to talk to them, and you begin to tell them about the vision God gave you. And you're saying, you know, God told me I'm going to be a millionaire one day. God told me he's going to prosper me. God told me that, that I'm going to finish my degree, and I know I'm raising three kids right now, and there's nobody helping me, and I know I'm dealing with some issues, and I know I dropped out of high school, but I'm going back to get my GED, and I'm going to go ahead and get my doctorate degree, and I'm going to become a lawyer and a doctor. And they're like, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, you're not special. Oh, precious. You just, you're just so precious. Well, you know... But if, even if you don't, God just loves you just the way you are, you know. They're looking at you like, you're all right. They're like, did you take your medicine? <laughs> yes, you are. You are going to be a doctor. Yes, you are. A great doctor. Oh, yes, wonderful. You're going to treat millions of people and have your own practices. Of and you know they're just, just, just feeding because they don't think, they don't even know what you, but, you're, but inside your spirit, you say, laugh at me now. You, you underestimate me now. That's all right. That's all right. See, look, look, you quickly, quickly. Some of you, did, some of you all week, you couldn't wait to shake Paula White's hand. You couldn't wait to get to, jo to, to, to Joyce. You couldn't wait to get to, to Jesse. You, couldn't, you can't wait to get to Ash at the end of the service. But, 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 but look, look to your right. Quick, look to your right. Look to your left. Look to your left. They may not look like much now. You're trying to get our little number by our tape. But if you knew who you were sitting next to, if you knew what God was going to do in their life in five years, you'd be asking for their business card. You'd be trying to shake their hand. Some of you don't even know the name of the person you sit next to. But God is going to raise them up. Look at your neighbor and say, don't underestimate me. I may not look like much to you right now, but I'm a man or a woman of faith, and I'm in the land of praise, and I have another spirit with me. Listen, I got, I, I, I've got to finish. I've got to finish. Get out, get out. Yeah. 
Listen, listen. Caleb had another spirit with him. Watch this. Now, watch what brought. Let me say this to you. Watch this, watch this. Jim, Aaron, watch this. Caleb was there. Pastor, watch this. He was there when they crossed the. We never heard about it. Caleb was there when the plagues destroyed the firstborn sons of all of Egypt. He was there, we never heard of him. He was there when Moses struck the rock and water flowed from it. He was there for the miracles in the wilderness, but we never heard about Caleb. What brought Caleb out of obscurity into a place of prominence was a crisis. And when crisis came, God raised him out of obscurity and brought him to a place of prominence. And I'm here to tell you, some folks may not know who you are now. They may not know your name. They may not know what you've done. They may not know who you are. But in the midst of a crisis, when all hell breaks loose and stuff starts going wrong, God is going to raise you out of obscurity and bring you to a place of prominence just by your time. Don't try to rush it. Don't try to speed it up. Just sit there and be patient because when your day comes, God will... God is waiting for a crisis so that your sterling spirit can reach the pinnacle and the zenith of your spiritual excellence that you can manifest the manifold glory of God that he placed in your life from the beginning of the world. Watch this now, watch. Crisis. Nobody knew who David was. Watch, 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 watch. David killed a bear. TBN wasn't there. Charisma didn't write an article. Because it was positive, that's why they didn't write an article. <laughs> he killed a lion. Nobody was there. No tape series. No video on how to kill a lion in three easy principles. No six audio cassettes. There was no kill the lion and kill the bear conference. <laughs> 